Uh, Today, though, I'm going to continue our series uh, on prayer as we walk through the Lord's Prayer. Um, And obviously today, we're reminded we all have lots of things that we need to take to God in prayer, and we're going to talk about that today. But um, I've also mentioned every week that the primary purpose of prayer we've learned in this series is not actually to inform God of the things we need Him to do. The primary purpose of prayer is that we would realign our lives towards God because that creates a trust and a confidence in God's will for our life and in his will in general. And when we have that confidence and trust in God, we're willing to fully surrender our lives to him out of love. And the reason this is so important is that today as we're turning the corner on what we're praying about, today we're going to start talking about how to pray for the things that we need The reason we needed to first understand that the primary purpose of prayer is to realign our life towards God before we pray about the things that we need is because when our life is fully surrendered to the will of God and we fully trust in the will of God, it changes the things we think we need and the things we ask God for. It will change the way we view what's going on in our life. We are going to pray differently. Now, we said you know, the the first several parts of this prayer... Um, we're all about God. The Lord's Prayer begins praying to God about God. In fact, let's look at it, right? Jesus said, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That was the, the first part of this series. What it means to pray, God, you are holy and set apart. Uh, God, uh, your kingdom come. That, that God's primary purpose of work in our life is not just to take us to him one day when we die, but actually Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God here even now to work in us. God, your kingdom come here and we're charged to take the kingdom of God to others. And then last week, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first half of the Lord's prayer is all about God. God, you're holy, your kingdom come, your will be done. The second half of the prayer turns and begins to pray about ourselves. Now that we've established who you are, that we want your kingdom to come and I want to surrender my life to your will, I then begin to pray about my own stuff and here's where we are today. Um, Give us this day our daily bread, all right? Give us our daily bread. So again, we're making this turn today. We're talking about the way in which we are to ask God for the things that you and I need. And the way we pray about the things that we need changes when we've surrendered to his will and we recognize who God is. Now, when it comes to praying for our daily bread, asking God for the things that we need, I think there's a couple common mistakes that we all tend to make. Um, one of these may be more than the other. One of the mistakes we tend to, to make is that we kind of expect God to do too much. Um, right? We, we ask God for things that he's just not going to give us. For example, I've been praying for most of my life that God would make me a millionaire. A multimillionaire. Because I believe with all my heart that I would make a very generous, kind, godly, rich person. And I've even told God, Test me in this. I know scripture says we're to test you, God. Test me. And if I'm selfish with it, take it back. But I believe I'll be generous with it and I'll do your will. So far, he has yet to grant that request. All right? I've expected him to do it. I've not seen it quite yet. The other side of prayer is that not that we expect too much, but I think this may be more the case for a lot of us, and that is that we expect too little. If I'm honest with you, there have been many times that I've prayed for something very specific that I knew I should pray very specifically for that thing, but I really didn't expect anything to change. You ever prayed for someone who was maybe terminally ill? God, heal them, bring healing to their body, pray for them, and yet you really were not confident, didn't expect, and pretty sure nothing was going to change, they were still going to pass away, right? We've wrestled with it. There's a tension there. I'm going to get into that a little more as we go along today. But one of these two extremes we all tend to to wrestle with. Either we expect too much or we expect too little. So here's the question. What should you and I expect when we pray for the things that we need in our life? Well, we're going to look at several different scriptures today. I want to start with one out of James, James chapter 5. And here's what James chapter 5 says about this. First, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And let me pause there for a minute because this is an important statement. It's a really big statement. Elijah, if you're not familiar with Elijah, he's one of the most significant prophets in the Old Testament. And he was sent by God ultimately to call the people of God to repentance. They had walked away and run away from God and turned from God. And he's calling them to turn back to God. That's really Elijah's role. 
And so it says that Elijah is a man with a nature just like ours. Um, and so that's like an encouragement. All right, so Elijah, he's going to do, that if his nature is like ours, then I can do what he did. Except here's what he did. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain. I don't know about you, but this has never happened when I pray. I have never prayed for something this big. I'm clear. I, I don't have that kind of power. Like, God, stop, like, how many, anybody praying that the storm would just dissipate this week? Didn't quite do that, did it? So apparently, Elijah has a nature like ours, but we don't have one like his. I don't know what that, right? Like, there's some confusion in this. Now, it's also important to understand that when Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, it wasn't because Elijah all of a sudden, on a whim, said, you know what I'm going to pray for today? I think it would be great if we had a three and a half year drought. God, make the rain stop. That's really not what happened. Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain because God sent Elijah to call the people of God to repentance. He was praying, remember last week, according to God's will. And we learned last week that when we pray according to God's will, he hears, and if he hears, we have what we pray for. Elijah was praying for something that God sent him to do to call the people of God back to God. It wasn't just this magical ability that Elijah had to pray, and whatever he asked for, God was going to do. But what we also see in this is a, is a tension of a, a couple of things that, 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 that are true that we have to understand when it comes to praying specifically, especially specifically for really big things. You need to understand this. I, want, I don't want you to miss this. That God somehow in, in the world, and I don't even understand how this works, God has made the world susceptible to our prayers. That's what the scripture seems to say. That we are to pray and to ask specifically for things. And when we do that, God does certain things when we pray. That the world, to a certain degree, is susceptible to the things that we pray. Um, all right? And, and, and again, Elijah prayed. And it, rain, it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed again and it rained. The world, in some way, was susceptible to the prayer of Elijah. The prayer that was according to God's will. The same is actually true for you and me. But at the same time, even though this is true, you have to remember this. That our prayers cannot control or overstep God. There is nothing about the way that we pray that can ever force the hand of God to do something that God knows is not good or God would not do. We, God is not indebted to us because we believe strong enough or we, you ever heard that? Like you, somebody prayed for something and God to do something and it never happened and maybe somebody told him, well, you just must not have had enough faith. You just got to believe stronger. Again, I believe pretty strongly that God's going to make me rich so far. <laughs> Hasn't happened. I guess I just don't have enough faith. Elijah prayed. It wouldn't rain. It didn't rain. But it wasn't about Elijah doing and causing God to do something that God wasn't already willing to do. Our prayers cannot force God's hand, control God's hand, or overstep God. This is one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith, by the way. That somehow the world is susceptible to the way that we pray, and at the same time, we can't control God or overstep what God is already doing. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to get really, really practical. What does it mean to pray in a very practical way for God to give us our daily bread? What does that mean? How do we do that? There's a lot of things I could say about that, but I, I've kind of summarized this, this message into to three different ways to pray for the things that we need, directed at three different people, really. Um, praying to God for, th for three different things in three different ways. The first is this. When we ask God to give us our daily bread, is to do something that we refer to as petition. That is, I'm going to petition God, I'm going to ask God for the things that I need and want. We are instructed in Scripture to do this. To ask God for our daily bread means to petition God for the things that I need, even ask him for the things that I want. Now there's what I would call some qualifiers in this a little bit, in the way that we do this. Here's what I mean. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes these words, a very familiar scripture for a lot of us. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. How many of us are far from perfect at doing this right here. <laughs> I dare say all of us in this room have something that we have a tendency to get anxious about sometimes. I, I, I'm not a particularly anxious person. 
right? I, I'm not a person that has really ever wrestled with anxiety or worry or a lot of fear. Um, I, again, not because I'm a better person than others who, who maybe do or because I have more faith. I just, anxiousness has not really been something that I wrestle with outside of one area that I've wrestled with a lot for the last 26 years. And that is the area of my kids. <laughs> um, I'm far more apt to be anxious about something with my kids than I am with anything else in life. Like when they started driving, Lord help me. Um, right? I mean, that's, that's in and of itself. I remember a time, my wife, could, she's sitting down here, she can remember this. Our daughter was driving home from college in South Florida and she was supposed to be home. She wasn't home yet. You know, we had the Life 360 app and you can see where everybody is. And I'm like, I'm gonna see where she's at. And it was showing she was down on the turnpike somewhere between um, uh, the coming into Orlando, between like the, uh, uh, the Fort Drum Service Plaza in Orlando, if you're familiar with where that is, and right about in the middle of that. Um, but she should be a lot farther home. And then she was just sitting right there and wasn't moving. And, and I don't know why I did this. I shouldn't have done that, but it's what a parent does. I, I'm like, I'm gonna look up on the maps and see if there's like an accident or something. And there's an accident like right where it has her, her deal. And then I realized that her, 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 the last report of her position was like an hour earlier. And I look up the DOT website and an accident had happened an hour earlier. And I can't get her on the phone. Her phone won't work. And so what do you think my mind went? Like she is the cause of the accident. And I'm like freaking out a little bit, which says, again, that's not normally me. And we're getting on the phone. How do we figure out if she's in this accident or not? And it, you know, as we're making all kinds of phone calls and I'm worried like crazy, all of a sudden I see her car pull in the neighborhood. And the deal was her charger cord was in her bag in the back of the, in the trunk of the car and she didn't have it and her phone died. I'm like, thank you, because the last hour just took 10 years off of my life, <laughs> right? So we all have things that it's difficult to, to uh, obey this about, that we're going to be anxious about. But Scripture says don't be anxious about anything. And then it gives us that reason, the way we're able to do that, to not be anxious. But in everything, here's how you keep that anxiousness away. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be specific with your request. God, here's what I'm anxious about. Here's what I'm worried about. Here's what I need. Here's what I'm walking through. I'm going to be specific about that. God, I need wisdom and energy to do my job today. Anybody ever prayed that or needed that? I never need that as a pastor. <laughs> Listen, the amount of times that I've prayed for wisdom, walking into a circumstance that I had no clue what I was going to do, no clue how to handle, right? Um, pray for that. Pray for anybody you ever prayed it for patience and kindness in a relationship. All the married people said. Yes. All the parents said. Yes. What about health and sickness or injury? Um, finances, support, overcoming challenges, whatever it might be. We are to very clearly and specifically make our request be made known to God. God, here's what's before me. Here's what I need. Here's what's going on. I'm giving this to you. I'm going to pray this to you. I'm going to take this to you. And here's the promise of Scripture when we do that. When we take, make our request known to God about the things that are making us anxious, here's the promise that God gives, that he's going to grant us everything we've asked just the way we've asked it. Right? No. Here's the promise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So here's the confidence we have. You remember John's statement a couple weeks ago? Here's the confidence we have in prayer when we ask anything according to his will. He hears us and we have what we ask for. Here's the confidence you and I have when we make our request known to God. Not necessarily that God will grant us exactly what we are requesting of him because we can never force him to do anything that is not for our good. The confidence we have is that God, here's my anxiousness, here's my worry, here's what has me overwhelmed today, here's what I need from you and what I'm asking of you, I'm making this request known to you, and here's the best part, God, whether you give this to me now or you do not, whatever you know best, I'm going to trust, but I'm going to expect and, and experience your peace is going to guard my heart and my mind in Christ in a way that doesn't even make sense to me. One of the greatest proofs that God is present and good in your life is not the absence of trials and suffering. It's his presence of peace with you in those moments. And that is the promise that he gives. He's going to guard your heart and guard your mind. And why is he going to guard your heart and mind? Because last week, when we ask anything according to his will, he hears and we have what we've asked. And part of God's will for you is peace. He will guard your heart. He will guard your mind with his peace. Now, but at the same time, we often ask 
specific things and nothing happens, right? We petition God for what we need. Sometimes we are given what we ask, sometimes we're not. And I wanna show you at least one reason why we sometimes do not receive the things we petition from God. Let's go back to James for a minute, James chapter four this time. He says, you do not have because you don't ask. So sometimes we don't, God doesn't give, we just don't ask him. If we'd ask, maybe he would give. And then he says, but sometimes you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly. And how do we ask wrongly? That we would spend it on our passions. Here's what James means, I think, by this. Here's the problem with the things we petition of God and why we sometimes don't get them. According to James, it's just good old-fashioned selfishness. God, I'm asking you for this because this is what I want. And I want you to give me this so that I can have what I want. We've all... It, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a little more participation today. Anybody else ever prayed selfish prayers? All right, good. The A15 was silent. And I, and I said, so, oh, only me? And somebody goes, yes, only you. <laughs> they were escorted out of the building. By the, no, they weren't. <laughs> but the truth is, sometimes we pray selfishly. We do. And the moments we pray selfishly, it's not because we're horrible people. Actually, Scripture says we are horrible people, right? Romans chapter 3, nobody's good, nobody's righteous, nobody's even done good. That's our bend, if you will. The reason we pray selfishly when we pray selfishly is because we've not first done the work of the first part of the Lord's Prayer, which is what? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. God, I want to align my life with your will. Because I believe that what you say is good is better than what I want. And so I'm willing to align myself fully with your will. Your kingdom come in my life. Your will be done. You're the holy one set apart. And when I'm not doing that, this is how I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray selfishly. Because I'm not aligned with the will of God. And when I'm not aligned with the will of God, my prayers will be selfish. And so here's the great part. I'm going to give you the simplest solution to overcoming selfishness in your prayers. There is an incredibly simple solution to that. You want to know what it is? Gratitude. Gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We looked at that last week. In all circumstances, give thanks. That is God's will for you. The simplest way to overcome selfishness in your life is to be grateful for the things God's already done in your life. And I think it's safe to say most of us take for granted so many of the good things that God's done in our life on an average day. We don't really pause. At least I don't. I don't pause as nearly like I should to say, God, thank you so much for this and for who you are. Uh, years ago, um, <laughs> uh, I remember sitting in a Chick-fil-A right over here having lunch one day. And there was a group of ladies sitting behind me. And they were upset. And they were upset with Chick-fil-A. And here's what they were upset about. You guys remember the cow calendars that used to come out every fall? And you could buy this calendar. It had Chick-fil-A cow, different cow for every month. And at the bottom of every month's calendar, there were also some coupons for some free food or a milkshake or whatever it was for that particular month, usually a couple of them. Well, for the longest time, those coupons had no expiration date. And, uh, and eventually, Chick-fil-A decided, you know what, we're going to put an expiration date. These coupons have to be used in the month of th that they're on. So if it's on February's calendar, you've got to use them in the month of February that year. Not an unreasonable thing, right? It just kind of makes sense. These ladies behind me were having a fit that there was an expiration date on these coupons. And literally, I hear one of them say, this is what's wrong with this country. I'm like, that's what's wrong with this country? <laughs> How about the fact you're complaining about what? I'm just sitting there and I'm trying to have lunch and I'm with a friend and he's talking and I'm not even listening to what he's saying because I can't get past these people right behind me just complaining about this free stuff not being the way they wanted to be free. And finally I turn around and I said, hey ladies, I'm sorry. I couldn't help it over here. Uh, you seem kind of upset about the, the coupons. Yes, can you believe this? There's an expiration date on these coupons now. I said, so just so that I'm understanding, you're upset with the way somebody's giving you something for free? This isn't for free. We paid for this. Uh, no, ma'am, you actually bought a calendar. They gave you the coupons for free. Why don't you mind your own business? And I literally said, well, I've been trying. I was in a mood that day, apparently. Not my most pastoral moments. But 
It certainly was fun. I felt better. I don't know about them. Anyway. Here's what I'm getting at. Here's, here's why gratitude helps combat the selfishness problem that every one of us has. And I want you to miss this. Until you and I are grateful for the blessings God has already given, we will never be satisfied with the ones we have yet to receive. The fact of the matter is God has already blessed you in Christ Jesus more than you and I could ever deserve from him. And if you can't think of any other way God's blessed you, if you are a Christian, that is the greatest way he could ever bless you. That there was a moment that he took your sin and my sin and the judgment that that deserved pulled that off of us and put it on himself on the cross and said, I'm going to pay the penalty you deserve to pay. I'm going to be both just, the one who is just and the justifier, Scripture says. I'm going to demand your sin be paid for, but I'm going to pay the price for it. If God never did anything else for you or me, that is more than we could ever repay. And yet he's done immeasurably more than that. And until you and I can actually be truly grateful for what God has already done in my life, we will never, ever be fully satisfied for the things we have, are still asking him for and have yet to receive. We just won't. If I'm not content with who I currently am in Christ, I'm not going to be content down the road when he gives me more. Gratitude is one of the most underdeveloped spiritual disciplines I think most of us have. And so let me just be clear again. Ask God for what you need. Make those petitions and requests known to the Lord. God, here's what I'm asking of you. And one of the greatest ways to know you're asking for things that you truly need is to first be grateful for the things God's already given. God, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for Christ. I'm grateful for the way you've already blessed me. Here is what I need, but I'm going to also leave this according and ask for this according to your will. Be grateful, be specific, don't be vague. But ask with gratitude. Second thing that our asking for God to give us our daily bread involves. Petition, ask God for what you need. The second one is what is called intercession, which is asking God on behalf of someone else. I'm going to pray to God for someone else. Last week we looked at this verse. I want to pull it back because I quickly referenced it, and I told you I didn't have time to jump into it, but I would today. Paul writes to Timothy, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, with thanksgiving also, there's that gratitude piece again. Notice how often that comes up? Again, why does it keep coming up? <laughs> because we're not good at it, that's why. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So we are to intercede for other people. Or to pray on behalf of other people. Now, I want to show you a, a way that Jesus interceded for us. Because remember, Jesus is the one that gave us the Lord's Prayer. Here's the way you are to pray. His disciples asked, teach us, and he's teaching them. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, will be done. Give us our daily bread. Here's one of the ways Jesus interceded and taught us how to intercede for other people. I want to show you this. This is in John chapter 17. This is Jesus' example for how to pray for other people. Just one way, one need that we have. This is what's called his high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying this right before he's crucified. Now he's in the garden. This is what he's praying. He says to the Father, I'm praying for them. And by the way, this them, he says, I'm praying for those you've given me and for all those who will believe it, through their testimony. So he's talking about you and me. Anyone who would ever believe Jesus was interceding for us right before he went to the cross. You and me and all who would believe. And he says to the Father, I'm praying for them, all who would ever believe. And here's what he prays. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Let me pause here for a minute. How many times I've heard people say, I'm just praying that the Lord will return and get us out of here. Lord Jesus, come. And look, that's not a bad thing to pray. I look forward to eternity in heaven with God, with all things made right, all things made new, the way they were intended to be. That sounds like a good day to me, all right? But I've also heard and experienced people praying for years, God, get me out of here. And you realize nowhere in Scripture are we told to pray that. In fact, Jesus himself didn't inter even intercede for us that way. He says, Father, I'm not asking that you take my children out of the world. I am asking though, that you keep them from the evil one. 
Now, our theme verse of the year out of, a fee, out of uh, um, yeah, Ephesians, about clothing ourselves, putting on the full armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. Keep the evil one away. Keep him at bay. Protect my children from him, which we are protected, if no other way, the spirit of Christ within us. But I'm going to pray that you keep them from the evil one. And here's the other thing that he prays. God, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So one of the ways Jesus was interceding for you and me was that God himself would protect us from our ultimate enemy. And one of the ways he would protect us from that enemy would be to sanctify us with the truth. Sanctify, I already talked about it in this series, that process of God making us more holy. So Jesus praying that you and I would become more like Christ, more like him, sanctifying us in in truth. He was praying for your sanctification. He was praying for your spiritual life to look more like Jesus. He was interceding to the Father for that. And here's why I'm belaboring this and how it applies to you and me. Have you ever been frustrated by somebody, maybe somebody that you know that has walked away from God or somebody that's living in a way that you know is contrary to God or somebody that you know is just this this almost hostile towards God and towards Christianity and towards the church. And the, to, you, know, you ever known anybody like that? And, and if you ever prayed some version of this, a, a person that's hurt you maybe, God, get them. <laughs> Scripture would seem to say, you know the best prayer you can pray for that person? You know what it is? Not God, get them. God, sanctify them in your truth. God, this person that's far from you, Sanctify them in your truth. You know, the the church as a whole is really good at pointing out things in the lives of people in the world that are not Christians that are sinful and wrong and things they shouldn't do. And often we're really good and work really hard at convincing them that they're sinful, they're bad, they're horrible, that you need to change doing that. What if we first started praying, hey God, you know what, that person over there that I am appalled at their behavior and the way they're living and the way that I think they're wrong, what if I just pray, God, you sanctify them in your truth rather than me trying to convince them that I'm right and that they're wrong? What if my first prayer was, God, you sanctify them, you work in them, God, you change them the way you want them to be. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jesus prayed that for you and me. I think we're called to intercede for those that are far from God that same way. So who's somebody? Here's a question that you know that's far from God that is either maybe breaking your heart or maybe just you don't like because of how far from God they are. When was the last time you prayed for them this way? God, keep them from the evil one and you sanctify them in truth. Your truth. That's what it means, partly what it means to intercede. Let me show you one other way it means to intercede. In James, we'll go back to James chapter 5. Is any one of you suffering? Let him pray. So again, going through a difficult time, ask God, God, this is what I need. Give me my daily bread. Suffering, pray. Anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Now, my guess is we're much better at the first statement here than we are the second. We're probably all much better at, I'm suffering, I'm going to pray. God, get me out of this and fix this. Then I am. I'm cheerful in a good mood. Let me sing some praise to God. Let me just say, God, thank you for this great day. And then he says, anyone of you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. We're called to physically intercede for the needs of one another. And yes, there's, there's an act of faith here. It talks about the elders of the church, the leaders. But this is not relegated only to those who are in charge or lead or anything like that. We all are called to do this, to intercede on behalf of one another. I remember a, a really good friend of mine, um, one of my wife's, they were missionaries in Papua New Guinea for many, many, many years, still with that same organization. And they took... The gospel to this uh, group had never heard the gospel. They wanted somebody to bring them God's talk. And they went to the Haywood people. A lot of you know the Copleys were involved in our church for many years. Uh, we still actually help support them and the work they're doing. But early on, they had just begun to establish the church, had their first believers. And I'll never forget Keith telling this story. Of He, he had a nursing background. That's what he was. He was a nurse. And then got called to the mission field and was there. And they have these new Christians. And one of these new Christians comes and brings their baby, who was a young infant that was in respiratory distress, very evident. 
And he did not have what he needed there medically to help this child. He knew there was nothing really he could do. He did what he could, and the, the, the child expired. It quit breathing, and he just began to pray. And what he began to pray, though, was for the faith and the people uh, of, those, uh, of this new church. Yes, he was praying, God, heal this child. But God, I'm also concerned and worried about the faith of, of these new Christians. And yet I trust you. What you say is good is what's best. But I'm asking God that you would guard their faith, protect them from the evil one. He's praying, and he's praying over this child. It's gone on for like an hour. This child hasn't breathed, and all of a sudden the child starts breathing. Child's still fine today, walking around, no lasting effects from all of that. And he's like, I'm clear, I didn't do anything. I don't have the ability to do that at all. God resurrected this child in the, and just established and solidified the faith of these new believers. Amazing story, right? Now, at the same time, how many of us have had someone we knew that we cared about and we loved that was sick and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and yet they were not healed that way by God? So why does God answer some sometimes and doesn't seem to answer that prayer other times? I know this is sensitive, but I really want you to hear this, church. That any time God has ever healed anyone physically, whether it was Jesus himself or one of the disciples or somebody today prays and God heals and it is supernatural and miraculous. Whenever that happens, the point of that miracle is never the physical healing. Because you know what happens to everyone who's ever physically healed of something today? Eventually, what's going to happen? They're still going to die. You've never met anybody running around Claremont that Jesus healed 2,000 years ago. I've said that before, right? It's not like a perpetual groundhog day. You can skydive without a parachute, hit the ground, hop up and do it again because Jesus healed me and I could never die. That doesn't work that way. They still all died, which tells me that the point of the healing wasn't the physical healing. It was always something greater. It was something spiritual. Because it's appointed that a man wants to die and then to stand before God. And that's not always easy to accept. And it's, we grieve loss. And the reason we grieve bodily, physical loss and death is though even though, and I say this so many times at, at funerals, just like I, I, I did yesterday. I officiated a service here yesterday. Every time we're around death, we know that it's coming. We know that it's natural, but it also feels so unnormal, like it shouldn't happen, right? We know it's going to, but it feels like it shouldn't. You know why that's the case? Scripture says it's because we're created in the image of God not to die. It's not the way we were built and designed. We were created to live eternally with our heavenly father. It is a part of the fallen sinful world that we're in that's broken it. And so, yes, though, when it comes to that need, that physical need, we are to pray, make our request known to God. God, I pray that you would heal. And it is not a cop out to say, and yet, God, your will be done. I was taught that at one point. Don't pray for someone who's sick and use the cop out of God. I pray you would heal them, but your will be done. That it's given an excuse of, well, if it doesn't happen, it's be, you know, that, that you've given God a reason out. It didn't happen because you didn't have enough faith. And man, I've learned, I wrestled with that for a long time. I was taught that. There was a time in my life that I believed that. If I prayed over someone that was sick and they didn't get better, it was because I didn't have enough faith. And I am grateful that God freed me of that lie. That Brian, you can never have enough faith to do in the life of somebody what truly needs to happen. That is my job. And to pray my will be done, even when you ask specifically for this, is not a cop-out. It is you surrendering your life in love to me because you believe and know that my will is better than yours. And at the same time, intercede specifically. God, here's what I'm asking for. And yet I'm going to trust your will. Final way to pray um, for God's needs. I told you I had a hot shower today. I'm fired up. Okay. <laughs> Final way that it means to ask God, pray that God would uh, meet our daily needs. You're going to love this one. It's what's called lament or praying what you feel. What does it mean to lament? Anybody want to take a guess? Cry out. Here's the way I love to divine lament. Complain. That's really what a lament is. It's a complaint. It's a complaint to God. Um, and we are actually allowed, believe it or not, to bring our laments and our complaints to God, whatever they are. That should be an encouragement, because I've got a few. And I want to show you an example of Scripture of how we're taught to lament and bring those to God. This is Lamentations. If you ever want to be encouraged, it's a great read. Lamentations chapter 3 is the prophet Jeremiah lamenting 
to God, complaining to God that Jerusalem has been destroyed, the nation has crumbled, he himself is suffering terribly. And here's what he prays in chapter three. He says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. God has made my flesh and my skin waste away. This is all, he's complaining about what God's caused. This is the way I feel, God. You've caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. You've broken my bones. You have besieged me. And you think you've said some rough things to God. And all I have now is bitterness and tribulation. And yet, Jeremiah is one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. And then he says this, right? Here's how he goes on about this. Though I cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. My soul is bereft of peace and I've forgotten what happiness is. Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet, but he's also the whining prophet, right? No. I believe he is doing exactly what you and I are called and allowed by God to do. God, in this moment, here's how I feel. I feel like you aren't listening. I feel like you've shut out my prayers. I feel like you have caused me to suffer. That's the way I feel. That's what Jeremiah does. God, this is what's in me. You know, J.I. Packer, a theologian that passed away, I don't know, three or four years ago, very well known. Uh, theologian of the modern century, probably one of his greatest works, the book Knowing God. He says this about this idea of lamenting. I love this. And so our complaint prayers are not mere self-centered whining that life has not treated us right. Instead, our complaints are those of dependent children running in fear and hurt to our almighty Father who rules all things, who, if he chooses, can relieve our pain. That's what a lament is. God, this is what I feel. And I'm not just trying to, to be difficult. This is how I feel. Yesterday at the service I officiated, I say this often at services like that, especially when it's of someone who, in the eyes of most of us, was taken sooner than should have been taken. And that was the case yesterday. I'll often remind families in those moments, it's okay to feel what you feel, whatever that is. Even if, as a Christian, in your mind, it's not the faith, big Christian response I should have. Whatever you feel is how you feel. And what's amazing is that we have a God that doesn't say, bring me your laments as long as they're righteous. Bring me your laments as long as they're according to my will. Bring me your laments as long as they've been filtered and you've gotten through the difficult things and now you're seeing it a little more maturely. Bring me those. The rest just keep to yourself. That's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture gives us the example of Jeremiah saying, God, here's how I feel. How dare you? That's what I feel. I feel like you don't love me. I feel like you don't care. My soul is bereft of peace and yet peace is what you promised and I don't have it. Isn't it great to know that we have a God that says, ask me to give you your daily bread. And part of that is you letting me have how you feel and sharing it as bluntly as you need to, because I already know it anyway. As your heavenly father, I want you to bring that to me. And yet when we bring that to him, what also happens? God with thanksgiving, I'm going to ask you to fix this that I'm so aggravated and upset about, that I'm hurting about, that I'm lamenting and complaining about. And yet I also know that you are God that is good, and I'm going to surrender to your will, and I'm going to do my best to thank you for what you have given me, even as I wait for what you haven't. Again, I just want to suggest to you that it is amazing that you and I have a God that graciously invites us to petition for the things that we need, to intercede on the behalf of one another, and even lament and complain about the things that we don't like. And he loves us in the midst of it. And so what does it mean to give us our daily bread? It means to petition God for the things that you need. God, here's what I need. Here's what I want. It is to intercede on behalf of somebody else. God, I'm praying for them. Here's what they need. 
And I'm interceding on their behalf just as the Holy Spirit intercedes on my behalf. And it means to lament, to complain. God, here's how I feel. And so here's what I want to do today as we close. I thought it would be a great opportunity because I'm pretty sure all of us in here could find something with all three of these right now to take to our Father. And so I thought maybe before we leave, we could just practice praying for God to give us our daily bread. And so I'm going to lead us through a prayer. And in a moment, I'm going to give you a little space to petition, to intercede, and to lament. Just privately between you and the Lord. And then we'll go. So if you would, bow your heads and let me start us praying in the way that Jesus invited us to. Holy God, we thank you that you are set apart and so much bigger and greater than us. Hallowed be your name, God. We thank you that you brought your kingdom to us to save us who could never make our way to you. And God, we believe that your will is always better than ours. We want your will to be done in our life. But God, there's also things that every one of us in this room need that we don't have the ability to do and provide for ourselves. And so we ask you for them. So with your heads bowed, church, take a moment. First, petition. What is it that you need from God that you want to ask God for? Ask him. Don't be scared. Ask him. Be specific. Make your request known to God right now. Who is somebody else that you need to intercede for? Physical need, an emotional, relational need, a spiritual need. Maybe somebody far from God. Take a moment and intercede on their behalf. And we also serve a God that accepts our laments. So if there is a complaint that you have, something that you don't understand, that you're upset about, that hurts, let that be known to God. And finally, as you're praying, What is something that you can say, but God, thank you for your blessings in my life. I am grateful for this. Pray with thankfulness. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask in your son Jesus Christ's name. And everyone said, amen.